Hello and thank you for joining us. You're listening to a We Do Talk with David Jakes. I'm doing one of my favorite things today and that is to do an in-person interview. And I'm in Toronto and again a great privilege because I haven't been in Toronto for three years due to the pandemic. And I'm attending a conference for the Revolution Her Summit which is a group of empowering women and inspiring women that do a lot of things to help and inspire each other. And you never know who you're going to run into at these conferences, and it's been a great honor to meet just today Evelyn Santiso, um, who is a local girl, I think, from Toronto. Yes. And so, Evelyn, thanks so much for sitting down to chat today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, I, I've been saying to myself for the last couple of months that um, I, I want to do something and I want to have the courage to do something online and just get out there and tell my story. And, and you do have quite a story and, <laughs> and really it's a story of empowerment, self-confidence, reinventing yourself, making changes in your life and in just a nanosecond you went from fashion to real estate. That's right. <laughs> Probably not that unusual. I'm sure there's other people that have gone from fashion to real estate, but your journey there has mm -hmm. been an interesting one. Yes. Um, before we go into the fashion industry, mm -hmm. you told me that you actually wanted to be a police officer. That was your first love. Yes. Well, as a child, um, you know, I came to Canada when I was only six years old. And um, I saw the police officers and I always loved their uniform. and. Any time that I, I thought about protection or anything like that, and you see it on TV all the time, um, you always think of police officers as heroes. You always think of them as helpful. You always think of them as people that help people, right? They rescue you like heroes. So, you know, I grew up with that sort of mentality that that's what police officers were. Mm -hmm. And um, when I went to high school, I decided that I wanted to be a police officer when I was going to be done high school. But you didn't. Why, why did you not become a police officer? Well, my mother said to me, Evelyn, I don't want you to die. Oh. I, I cannot handle that, so please don't, don't be a police officer. I, you know, and I think that you shouldn't do that. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be heart-wrenching for me every day to think that you're out there and uh, anything could happen to you. So that really resonated with me when my mother said that because yeah. I know that she loved me so much and that she sacrificed herself to come to Canada and make a life for us. So I just couldn't go against her, you know, hardcore, yeah. you know, desire for me not to get hurt. So that would be a tough one to say, sorry, mom, I'm going to go and do it anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So then that's why I didn't do it. But um, at that point I said, you know, I still want to help people. But, you know, I want to help people and I want to make them feel good and feel better. So um, I had taken biology and chemistry and all those sciences in school and I was always very good in that. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I think I want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. So when I signed up for the co-op program in high school at that time, they accepted me to George Barham College, which is one of the best colleges for nursing back in those days to be a registered nurse. I got accepted into the program and I started doing co-op at St. Joseph's Hospital here in Toronto. <sighs> what an experience that was because I got the opportunity to go to all the different uh, divisions of the hospital. I got to see the administration department, I got to see the um, geriatric ward, I got to work in the birthing um, ward, um, and I got to go, well, not, not so great, but I got to go to the morgue as well. Mm -hmm. So it really gave me a deep insight as to how the hospital inner workings. Um, but, you know, I started working every day in the geriatric ward more and more, where I was dealing with uh, the elderly who were living in the hospital due to conditions. And I realized that the way that I am as a person, I give all I can out of myself and I genuinely care for people. And I got to the point where I was visiting this one particular patient, which I remember very well because her name was also Evelyn, like me. And she was actually a Hollywood actress. And she said to me, back in the glamour days, I used to be in Hollywood and, you know, I used to love going to the glamour parties and all the stuff. And at that time, I was dabbling in being a makeup artist while I was still, you know, dabbling in school. So. I said, don't worry, Evelyn, I'll take care of you. And um, mm -hmm. she, she was suffering a couple of conditions like dementia and, mm -hmm. I don't know, Parkinson's disease or something. 
So every morning I would find her trying to put her makeup on, but her lipstick was going all the way around her mouth. Mm. And I felt so bad. And I'm like, Evelyn, do you want me to help you with your makeup? And I just like, oh, Ruth, that would be fantastic. She used to call me Ruth because apparently she had a beautiful uh, niece that she loved dearly, who apparently didn't visit her very much, but she loved her dearly. And she thought I was her, so she used to call me Ruth every you day. You reminded her of Ruth, I guess. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I never used to correct her. I used to be like, okay, well, yeah. she's calling me Ruth. But if I tell her I'm Evelyn, she was confused. She was like, I'm Evelyn. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, fine, I'll just be Ruth for her, right? But anyways, months and months passed like that, and I kept on helping her every day, brushing her hair, making her look pretty. She had lots of jewelry she used to like to put on and make up. And uh, she always liked to wear red lipstick. She said to me, I used to, in the days of my day, we used to wear red lipstick. That was the thing, right? And the rouge on your cheeks. Um, so I always used to make sure I used to put red lipstick on her because that's what she loved. And um, so what ended up happening is um, one day I came in to the hospital. I was super excited to go see Evelyn and say hello, like I always did. And her bed was made up. There was nobody there, not a trace of Evelyn anywhere. And I went around and asked the doctors, I asked the nurse station, like, what happened? Where's Evelyn? Did she leave? Did Ruth pick her up? And she said, they said to me, Evelyn passed away last night. And still to this day, as mm. I say this, I, I kid you not, I get like goosebumps in my arms because that's how I felt. I felt this like discouragement, this surreal feeling in my heart. And I'm like, okay, well, this is what being a nurse is all about. Yeah. You take care of people, you get to know them, and being the way that I am, you give them your heart and you care about them so much, and then this happens. Yeah. I'm not cut out to be a nurse. Yeah. I can't do it. It's just too much. But you love making people feel better. Yes. And yes. so is that what took you into fashion, to help people Yes, I feel wanted better? to make people feel better, look better, mm -hmm. um, have confidence, look beautiful, and all that stuff. So um, I went into fashion merchandising and fashion marketing. Um, right after uh, university, I, I got a job at uh, Hudson Bay Company, working for the fashion director as an assistant fashion director. And that was like my dream job. I absolutely loved it. I used to travel. I used to go to trunk shows. I used to go to fashion shows. Um, we used to go sourcing overseas, and I got to work with some fantastic ladies to, to this day. They are actually designers, and they are couture um, designers, some of them, and I still keep in contact with them. Um, so definitely an amazing industry, but it was like, you know, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day, yeah. go, 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 multiple travel, travel, travel. So anyways, in those days, I was, you know, I was very, very young after university. I was just in my 20s. And I was traveling, I've traveled to like 58 countries, not just for work, but also for pleasure because I was newly engaged and, you know, getting married soon. And my fiance was a dot comer. So, you know, we were traveling all the time and it was really exciting time. But yeah. um, I'm glad I did it. It was, yeah. it was a really nice time. And that type of lifestyle, of course, when you have children mm -hmm. comes to an end. Yes. And you are a mother. Yes. Of yes. two kids. Yes, okay. that's right. That's right. And um, how was that transition for you from a busy working professional to being a mother? Well, um, there was a long haul actually because in between all of that, uh, for about uh, 10 years of my life, I was an entrepreneur. I, um, I transitioned from the spa industry uh, in my 20s to the spa industry in my 30s. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, fashion industry in my 20s and um, fashion, uh, sorry, in spa industry in my 30s. So I started becoming, I, I became a spa owner and I actually had uh, multiple opportunities to travel as well and I went to the conferences like Cosmoprof and uh, the International Spa Conference and I saw all of the different product lines and got to select them and, you know, finding the right location and I decided to make my spa in Oakville, Ontario, where there's like a lot of competitive spas. Some of the best spas in Ontario are actually in Oakville. So um, I came in and there used to be like these amazing spas there uh, that had been in existence for 20 years. And uh, long story short, um, when I came in, I got interviewed by Toronto Life uh, magazine and they named me one of the best spas across the country. 
as um, you know the new the newcomer, wow. and uh, I also got nominated for the Platinum Award for three years in a row as one of the top spas huh. in across Canada. Wow. Mm -hmm. well, congratulations! That's a, a, a great thing to have behind you in your history. Yes, I, I enjoyed it a lot, and at one point I got a standing ovation at the Leading Spas of Canada conference. Wow. Um, because um, they really loved my concept of my spa. It was called the Fifth Element Day Spa, and it incorporated the five elements of nature into all the treatments, and it used to help people uh, to balance their life. Right. So again, you were following that theme of doing things to help pe make people feel better. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And so after that, um, you know, I got married again. I found love again after my... Um, my divorce with my first husband, um, who inspired me to learn a lot about business hmm. and about um, the way things are managed uh, and about uh, how to invest your money, right? You know, we were blessed and we were able to travel 58 countries. I, I got a lot of exposure to so many different cultures, foods, yeah. you know, different ways of doing things. and. Um, so I really feel like that was a stepping stone. It was very heartbreaking for me at that time because um, I was young, I was only in my 20s, and I was madly in love. And um, unfortunately, it ended in a, in a bad note. Um, you know, I wanted to have a baby more than anything in the world. That was my biggest, biggest thing. Even in my 20s, I always wanted to have a baby. Um, but I didn't get to do that because um, he unfortunately decided to mm -hmm. have a baby with somebody else. Mm -hmm. so. And that's the end of our relationship. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Ten years passed. I was with another, um, uh, well, partner of mine who eventually became my second husband. But we found out after ten years of being together, and we were very, very happy. He was impotent, and he couldn't have children. Mm -hmm. And that was the one wish that I always wanted more than anything in the world. We separated for various different things, and at the end of the day, um, we found out you know, a couple of months right after my divorce that um, I fell in love again and, you know, whirlwind passion. And my daughter was born, mm -hmm. and for the whole time I was pregnant with her, the doctors told me that she was a boy. And deep in my heart, I always thought, oh my God, I, I want to have a girl so badly because I want to have her as a princess, I, mm -hmm. I want to put bows on her, you know, like I come from a family with four daughters, so it was all about girls in my family. She was my sister. There, there's nothing quite like becoming a parent mm -hmm. to change a lot of your outlook yes. on life. Yes. And that, that will do it for in many different ways for you, so, yes. um, and I can, can just see the way that you talk that the joy of having children, and you have a son as well, I believe. He is my little he, he's, he's, he's the love of my life. Like, I love my husband, but my son is like the love of my life. And yeah. um, he makes me smile every day when I wake up. Okay. Um, he's three years old right now. And, um, you know, I, I breastfed both my children for two and a half years. Um, so it's been quite the battle. And right after I had my son, I gained an immense amount of weight. It was like I went mm -hmm. up like almost 200 pounds from where I was wow. and that was hard because um, I was always really into you know fashion and, and looking beautiful and all of that but regardless even when I was super big I still went out and dressed up and dressed in the best I could in bright colors and you know just the way that I like to dress and um, you know because I just felt that it doesn't matter what size you are um, you, everybody's beautiful and everybody yeah. can look beautiful regardless of your size. You can still be happy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I actually started a company which me and my daughter started actually last year just for, um, you know, for a little summer project. My daughter wanted to learn about business mm -hmm. and it was a plus size women's and girls online store. Okay. Yes, to empower my daughter, right. to show her that, um, yeah. you know, being plus size doesn't mean that you don't have right. to wear Th There is a clothing. place for everyone and there exactly. is something for everyone. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. But and then I, I decided because I started having some issues in my health um, and I realized I had to do something. I tried every diet under the sun, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. This, Dr. This, metabolic diet, cabbage diet, you diet, that diet, like every diet under the sun I tried. Nothing worked. 
Yeah. I'm a foodie. I love food. I mm -hmm. love the taste of food. Um, so it's very, very hard for me to stick to a diet that worked. So I made the conscious decision that for the sake of my children and for me to get healthy and because I knew that I've tried everything. I even joined the gym and got a personal trainer actually for a while and tried to lose weight and I think I lost like a total of five pounds mm. in like six months, which was not very much. Um, but yeah, so I decided to have um, gastric bypass surgery. Okay. Uh, that was about a year ago right. in August. And um, you could say it really changed my life um, because I was borderline diabetic and I was starting to show signs of concerns with cholesterol and other issues right. uh, because I didn't want to have issues. Um, there was a point uh, during that time that um, we found out that my mother had cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically told me that she had like four months to live. Mm -hmm. But thanks to my mother's great intense um, belief in God, God had mercy on her. The doctors couldn't believe it. We traveled everywhere to look for ways to help her. And, uh, you know, the Princess Margaret Hop Hospital in here in Toronto helped her. And uh, even the doctors couldn't believe it. Like, after, after five years of battling cancer, and they gave her four months to live, it was gone. Yeah. They couldn't explain it. Huh. They did a lot of treatments, but they still didn't think that the treatments would work. Like, they literally said, we've done all we could, we gave you all the treatments, and this is it. Like, she went to Magigori and she went to another place in, in Portugal where they say the Virgin Mary had appeared, which my mom is an avid Catholic, so she's really <laughs> happy to do that. Um, but after those visits, that's when she came back and had some scans and her cancer was gone. Yeah. It disappeared. Yeah. It was literally a miracle that yeah. we were all waiting for. So this was the lady that when you were 17 mm -hmm. told you not to be a police officer because she didn't want to lose you and she wanted you to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and you were still there and still are there for her today. So that's, that's mm -hmm. a beautiful story. But mm -hmm. um, Evelyn, coming back to um, your, your weight gain, did mm -hmm. you ever use food for comfort? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm a foodie, so, yeah. you know, with my emotions, whenever I had strong emotions, um, eating chocolate, cakes, and yeah. so many other things, you know. You, you know, during today's conference, I was listening to, um, I, mean, I think her name was Kendra Williams, you may mm -hmm. have heard her, mm -hmm. and, and she was talking about um, her battle with mental health earlier mm -hmm. in her life, and mm -hmm. how she kept that very quiet, and, mm -hmm. um, and how she sought help with a nutritionist yes. and who told her that her caffeine habit with yes. 15 cups of coffee and yes. her love of ice cream yes. was not going her way and yes. processed sugar was yes. things that she used to use. Mm -hmm. And she said something that was very funny and I, I wish I thought of it, but I, I won't pass it off as my mm -hmm. own. So she says, mm -hmm. nobody ever has a really crappy day and says, oh, my day's been so bad, I really need a salad. <laughs> never, <laughs> never, 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 never. If anything, when I had a terrible day, I always wanted a little piece of chocolate, even if it's the smallest little bit, yeah. but just chocolate. And um, even now, like after my surgery, I have like a monitor, I'm being monitored by a nutritionist and I have certain supplements I have to take and everything. But part of my nutritionist diet is that I'm allowed to have these little tiny keto chocolates once mm -hmm. in a blue moon. Okay. So I still get to have chocolate sometimes yeah. and I still yeah. get to have like small little bits of dessert, but they're very, very minute. Right. Um, but I still enjoy, yeah. um, you know, when, when I'm doing... Those little treats. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, but I feel uh, like a new person. I think I was just mentioning to somebody that um, the biggest impact for me was when I first started shopping um, after my surgery and I realized how much weight I had lost because I, I looked down at the, at the weight and I was just like, is that really my weight now? Wow. So I lost 120 pounds, 120 pounds. And I was, I was at a triple X size. And the last time, in that time that I went shopping after my surgery a year later in August, I was fitting into a medium march, which mm -hmm. is like phenomenal. Like I couldn't believe it. Like it was just, I 
extraordinary for me. And I, and I didn't believe that it was me in the mirror. And I kept on trying on the large and I'm like, why is this so big? This has never been this big, the large. Then I tried on the medium and the medium fit me. And I was like, is this me? Is this really my body now? Like, wow. Yeah. You know, and I'm just yeah. astounded. Like, it was just amazing. But it, it's, you know, people think, oh, well, you know what? You had surgery, so obviously you're going to lose the weight. Believe it or not, even with surgery, you still need to have mindset. Yes. Part of before the surgery happens, they do a mindset piece where they prepare you for the surgery to realize and to train your brain that you don't have to eat that way, that it's okay to eat this and this and this, and that it's not quantity, it's the quality of the food that you're eating. Mm -hmm. um, consistency will get you to the results. Right. So even if you have the surgery and you don't follow the steps that they're giving you, no surgery in the world is gonna mm -hmm. work. And some yeah. people, they've done the surgery and they were not successful at losing more than 20, 30 pounds, which is naturally just shedding right. water weight, it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when you stick to it, you exercise, you put through the nutrition and you, you know, stick to your, to, your, to your diet and the protein intake that you're supposed to take with the amount of sugar, it works. It really works. And it, it, it's a continuous battle. You still have to, you know, keep an eye. Yeah. On, on what you're eating and making sure that you're monitoring your weight. Yeah. Because it doesn't nothing just is go away. You don't turn no. the switch off and it just goes away. No, yeah. it doesn't. And your appetite does come back. After a year of surgery, your appetite mm. slowly starts coming back. So before, I never used to feel hungry at all, ever. I could go the whole day just drinking water. But um, eventually starts coming back and now it has. So now there is moments when I'm like, oh my God, it's dinner time, I need to eat something. Mm -hmm. And every time I think of that, I'm like, okay, well, the number one thing is protein first and then, you know, vegetables. And then if I'm still a little bit hungry, I'll have some sort of starch, right. which is not very often anymore. Because by the time I get to the, to the vegetables, I'm pretty much done. Yeah. Evelyn, you come across as a very confident person. You've mm -hmm. done a lot in your life, you've achieved a lot. You have a mm -hmm. lot of things to be proud of. Mm -hmm. But has it always been easy for you or has there been many struggles? And I could tell that the, the journey with your weight loss was mm -hmm. a big one and probably something mm -hmm. that helped to give you confidence. Yes. Well, honestly, I, I, I've, I've had a lot of confidence when I was younger. Um, you know, I could feel like I was like on top of the world and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, going through a divor two divorces, um, unstable relationships, like my daughter's father it was very, very bad. Uh, it ended in an unfortunate situation of, of abuse, and uh, I've dealt with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it made me stronger as a person. It made me realize what I really wanted, and I yeah. wasn't willing to you know, accept anything less of what I deserved. Because yeah. yeah. I've been through the struggle. I was literally left with like nothing. I mean, no money. I was about to lose where I lived. I was about to be homeless with my daughter being very young. She was only three years old at the time when I separated from her father. So it was, yeah, it was challenging. You challenge, yeah. Yeah, it was so. very, 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 very sad. But so um, you, you've come, you come through a lot. It looks like you're at a good space of life today. Yes. And what's yes. next for you? Well, you know, um, getting and overcoming all of those uh, adversities of life has been very challenging. Uh, luckily, I've met a lot of fantastic people along the way that have inspired me. One of them being my current spouse that just like, he really, you know, gives me the strength to keep on going every day. He supports me in everything I do. Um, he is a spiritual person that does uh, yoga. So sometimes we sit together and we do yoga together. So that helps to center and focus and, and you know, set our intentions every day um, as partners and as, you know, individuals as well. And he tells me the importance to connect with that inner me. Um, because the way that he sees it uh, is um, that we all have a universe inside of us and our spirit is actually the entire universe mm -hmm. that we are connected. So our spirit is the universe. So people say traveling the universe, being connected to the universe. The universe is inside of you. You just have to allow it to come out and be yeah. genuine to yourself, authentic.
Yeah. And um, that's, that's yeah. it. That's great. Well, I wish you every success with the next stage of your journey and the, the real estate business that you're in sounds very exciting. I know you're, you're traveling quite a lot with that. Yes, I'm, I'm, in, um, I'm a commercial broker now. Um, I got into it because I used to be a business owner and then I was a business development manager. Um, but then I started noticing that there was a, a niche, there was a market for people looking for locations for their businesses. And that's how I got into commercial real estate eight years ago. And now I've been doing that for about eight years. I'm working with investors across Canada and I'm gonna start opening up to the US. People who are looking for, you know, um, to invest in real estate in both multifamily, land development, land assembly, uh, industrial and uh, commercial retail spaces and franchise. So I work with a number of different uh, um, investor groups and uh, a lot of them are fantastic, you know, like-minded individuals that actually love mm -hmm. to grow and learn and a lot of them have diversified portfolios. It's not just real estate, they have other types of businesses. Yeah. So I love being around that energy. It really uh, resonates with me and it really makes me grow as a person. And um, my, next, my next adventure, since you asked, is um, or adventure or thought or my next focus is to create a group uh, for professional women who want to invest in real estate um, and uh, you know empowering them to take yeah. take the chance uh, don't be scared and um, allow themselves to to go for it and and I was in a summit with uh, Tony Robbins actually last weekend which was absolutely phenomenal and it's in one of the things that uh, one of the uh, speakers said, he said, your vision is your vision alone and nobody else's. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, everybody has their own prescription. So if you put on somebody else's glasses, whether it's your partner, your friend, or anybody that you know, they're going to look at your glasses and they're going to go like, what? Excuse me? Like, this I can't see anything. Right. It doesn't yeah. look right, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically they're saying, nobody has the same prescription as you. The prescription is for you and you alone, and only you can see your vision. Right. So sometimes we think, oh, well, you know, what will my partner will think? What will he say? Or, you know, what will my husband say? What will my daughter say? Or anybody? Nobody can see your vision. Yeah. You yourself have your own prescription. So just yeah. go with your own vision and follow it. Yeah. So great inspiring words for us to end on. Yes. You have your own vision, and don't let anybody take it away from you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Evelyn, thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you. And I wish you every success for your new venture. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. And thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave your comments below and subscribe to our channel. And I'll see you next time. We upload a We Do Talk every week. So if you enjoyed this one, please subscribe and leave your comments below.